As we, uh, we know today uh, around the country here in the United States, it's a National Sanctity of Human Life Day. And as we look up the word sanctity, the definition is very important because it says of being very important and worth protecting. Isn't that wonderful? So, then the definition clearly tells us that life is worth protecting. Amen? Amen. And, and this national day not just represents those of us that are here to help protect physical life, but also spiritual life. And in the message today, we're going to be focusing on 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verses 8 through 10. And... It's not only been called for us to protect the life of the unborn, but also to protect the life of those that are already born, those that are here. And we do this by making humanity aware that you and I have life because someone gave their life to give us life. And that someone is Jesus Christ. But what is the greatest form of thanksgiving? For life, when we think about the sanctity of life, or the protection and the worth and the importance of life. What is the greatest form of thanksgiving? It is what Jesus Christ Himself once said in the Gospel of John. Jesus said, As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father. Listen to what He said. And he finishes the scripture by saying, And I lay down my life for the sheep. What a form of thanksgiving for the sanctity of life. Amen? To many people in our present day, Thanksgiving is just subject to two holidays here in our country. Sadly. Thanksgiving and Christmas. And then it seems as if time passes and we, we kind of forget about Thanksgiving throughout the whole year. Thanksgiving comes around and everybody wants to thank God for something, but November ends, December ends, and we kind of go back to our regular routine in life. But Thanksgiving for us is every day. It should be an everyday thing for us. Now, as we read First Chronicles chapter 16, Something was going on here in this wonderful description of 1 Chronicles. And I'm going to read it one more time in verse 8, 1 Chronicles 16, verse 8. It says, Give thanks unto the Lord and call upon His name. Now, this, is the, this is Ezra speaking here. And Ezra says, Make known His deeds among the people. Sing unto Him. Sing psalms unto Him. Talk ye of all His wondrous works. Glory ye in his holy name, and let the heart of them rejoice. Of who those that seek the Lord. Now I want to give you a little bit about a little historical background on First Chronicles and what we're reading here. If you didn't know, First Chronicles and Second Chronicles was one book in its totality. Later on, they were separated during the translation of the Old Testament into the Greek language. So this is why we have 1 Chronicles and 2 Chronicles. But they were all one put together. Such a book does not tell us exactly who the author is. We don't exactly know who the author of the book of 1 and 2 Chronicles is. But according to Jewish history, they've always attributed this to the priest Ezra. They've always attributed to him. They've always said Ezra was the one involved in this. Now Ezra is said to have written the book. I want you to understand this. During a time when the Jews were returning back home from Babylonian slavery. So just imagine that Ezra is calling the people to give thanks to God when they're going back to Jerusalem from being under captivity for more than 70 years, being under captivity. But as the Jewish people arrived to Jerusalem, they saw a city that was once great and powerful. They saw a city that maybe their, their, their forefathers or their ancestors, their grandparents would share with them about how Israel and Jerusalem was a glorious city. Great big walls covered that city. 
But as they went back, they saw a city that was destroyed. They saw a city that was in ruins. Nothing like that, what they had heard from their past family members. It wasn't the Jerusalem and the glory that they had seen and heard years before. But Ezra writes this book to remind the people of Israel that God's promise still stands. Isn't that wonderful that you and I also need to be reminded about God's promises? Not just every few Sundays, but every day be reminded of the promise of God upon our lives. He wrote this to remind him, look, Jerusalem is in ruins, but God has promised something great. Amen? Amen. It's interesting to note also that in 1st and 2nd Samuel, as well as 1st and 2nd Kings, it speaks about the people of Israel at this precise moment. However, when we read 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra takes them all the way back to the beginning. He doesn't start with the time when they're leaving Babylon. He says, no, he goes all the way back and he begins with Adam. He's showing them, look, the God that we serve has been here before time was even created, was before it was even heard. And Ezra is taking them back there. There was a purpose to all of this, and we're going to read about this. First Chronicles 16 and 17. Now the book of Chronicles pointed Israel to being reminded of what? Of their history through Adam. Of the captivity of Babylon and of the time of their promised freedom. That's wonderful. It was also to remind them that God's promises and His intentions for His people will always come to fulfillment. And sometimes we may not see what God is doing, but I love that wonderful song that, that says Waymaker, where we know that God is working in the background. And sometimes we don't see the things that God is doing. You know, uh, recently I was reading uh, uh, an article uh, about a brother who said that he would pass by on his way to one of a preacher's home for six months, and he kept looking at this house that they were building in a very wealthy area, and he saw that the garage was detached from the house. And it just baffled his mind. He said, why would they do that? And he would pass by again. It would be the same thing. And he noticed that that detachment... He said, well, it will cause a big problem because during the weather time, these people are going to get wet. They're going to be in the snow. They're just, it's going to be bad, he said. But as he began to pass by, one day he noticed that the garage was no longer detached, but it was now attached to the house. And it came to his mind and he said, one thing I noticed, he said, is that I was looking at the house on the outside, not noticing that the builder had the blueprints and I didn't have the blueprints. So in other words, what, what he was trying to tell us is that sometimes we'll look at things on the outside not knowing that God has the blueprints. And when God has the blueprint, we have nothing to worry about. Now we may see the, the local church here, we may see different ministries all over the place and, and think when we're seeing the present that that's what it's going to be, but God knows the future. And Ezra is reminding the people, we're leaving Babylon, we're coming back to Jerusalem, it's all destroyed, it's all in ruins, but he tells them, don't worry, God has a promise. He's promised that he would be able to rebuild it. God has done it. It was also to remind them of his promised land that he had given them. It was to remind them that they were the people of God. They were the holy nation. They were set apart for God for a reason. It was to remind them that the promise that God had made to King David years before all of this took place. Why did they fall into Babylonian captivity? Because they strayed away from the purpose of God. And that's a danger for not just them, for us too. When we stray away from the purpose of God, from the word of God... We are in dangerous ground. It was to remind them of what true worship was. 
and is something that had not been practiced while they were under Babylonian captivity. You know, one thing when I read about Israel and being in Babylon that just reminds me of what they were going through is that old song that says, by the rivers of Babylon. You ever heard that one before? And there's a description in the scriptures where the Israelites are there by the rivers of Babylon. You see that today? That's, that's in Iraq today, if you see that area. And in that area is where Saddam Hussein, if you remember the dictator, he, has, he built his palace right, right outside the walls of Babylon. He didn't know, but he was fulfilling prophecy. And I don't want to get off course, but he was fulfilling prophecy because the Bible says that nothing would ever be built within the walls. But Israel is standing there by the river, and they told him, sing us the songs of Zion. Sing us those hymns of Zion. And they turn around and say, how can we sing? the songs of Zion in a strange land. It was to remind them that God had taken them out of that captivity. Now, if we go back, if you go back with me to 1 Chronicles chapter 16, we're going to look at verse 8. And we'll notice something through verse 8 all the way to verse 12 of 10 forms or 10 commands in these verses, that God gives them to remind them of who He is. First Chronicles 16, 8 through 12. What are those 10 forms of command? Number one, give thanks unto the Lord. Number two, he says, call upon His name. Number three, he says, make known His deeds among the people. Number, number four, he says, sing unto him. So we're taking this from verses 8 through 12. Number five, he says, talk ye of all his wondrous works. Number six, that command is to glory ye in his holy name. Number seven, let the heart of them rejoice. Number eight, seek the Lord. Number nine, seek His face continually. Amazing. And then, number ten, remember His marvelous works. You know, those ten commands were taken from verses 8 through 12. Isn't that wonderful what God is telling us? Why is it that the writer is pointing to us these points or these points of thanksgiving? The answer is found in 1 Chronicles chapter 15. And in the beginning of verse 16. You see, if we realize, if we were to go back to read chapter 15, a great event of importance had taken place which had positively affected the entire people of Israel. What was that? What was that great event? It was that the Ark of the Covenant had not been in its resting place, known as Jerusalem, and it had come back. And you remember the Old Testament story. As the ark came back, King David rejoiced, and he, and he danced in the street. And he just went on. He had a good old time. I, I told people, I said, David was a Pentecostal. He, he had a wonderful time out in the street. Because the Ark of the Covenant had come back. Why? Because it represented that the presence of God was coming back. Now listen to this. That's in verse 15. So that tells us when the presence of God is welcomed into His church, then God's blessings are also coming to His church. But why? Because the people were willing to obey His word. Where does the church stand and fall today? On the Word of God. We stand on the Word of God, but if we get away from the Word of God, we are in danger. This is why I love one of the five solas of the, of the Reformation. One of them was in Latin, sola scriptura, which means scripture alone. And that was the driving force for these reformers here, the Bible. That was the driving force. They knew that 
in order to receive what God had for them, they had to stick to the Word, the Word of God. Now the ark had come back. Now if we go to chapter 15, go with me to 1 Chronicles chapter 15, verse 28. The reason I'm saying this is because this will help us understand chapter 16. Chapter 15, verse 28 the Bible says, Thus all Israel brought up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. With what? With shouting. I tell you, they were Pentecostals. <laughs> they brought it up with shouting and with sound of the cornet and with trumpets and with cymbals, making noise with saw trees and harps. And it came to pass as the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came to the city of David, and Micah, the daughter of Saul, looking out at the window, saw David dancing and playing, and she despised him in her heart. Oh, you know, the devil's always going to try to get in the way. <laughs> Every time we want to worship God. But that didn't stop David. <laughs> and it didn't stop the Israelites from honoring and thanking God. And you know, that's the most beautiful thing. When we can honor and thank God, even in the worst situation we're going through in life. That's when you can see God's hand working. Now, the Ark of the Covenant was one of the most instrumental symbols of faith and the presence of God. You see, within the Ark of the Covenant, we had the tablets of the Law of Moses, the Ten Commandments. We had a pot that was full of manna, of the supernatural food that God had given them. And we had Aaron's rod was in there. The Ark of the Covenant served as a, listen to this, a religious symbol where the people could meet with God for Israel. His presence would come upon the ark when the priests were present, and it was a symbol of God's presence over the people of Israel. And after seeing the commands of verses 8 and 12 of 1 Chronicles 16, now we're going to see why the people of Israel were given the commands to thank God. The ark had come back. Now why are we going to thank God? How are we going to thank God? How are we going to worship God? God. You know, they were doing almost what we're talking about today, the sanctity of life. Because they knew that God had protected them. And that God knew that His people were important to Him. Now, let's see here. Verse, chapter 16, verse 13. It says, O ye seed of Israel, His servant, ye children of Jacob, his chosen ones. So let's talk about these three models of thanksgiving. Number one, remember that they were chosen by God. And we need to be reminded that sometimes too. Huh? They were reminded that they were chosen by God because he tells them in, in 1 Chronicles 16, 13, one more time, O ye seed of Israel, his servant, ye children of Israel. And then he says, his chosen ones. First, we have to remember that we're reading a psalm of worship. In verses 8 through 36, this is a psalm of worship. They're worshiping God here. Here the writer of Chronicles was reminding them that they were chosen as the people of God. He's telling them, hey, this is your identity. You are God's chosen people. Remember that. Here the writer is reminding them of, his, of their ancestors and how God used them to keep God's promise going. God used them. God used Jacob, Abraham, Isaac. God used all these men. And one thing that they were willing to do was to, by faith, obey God and His Word. And He reminds them of God's promises that they don't change. Isn't that wonderful? But how can I apply this to my life today? That we're reading the Old Testament. Some people say, well, you know, I don't read the Old Testament. It's a lot of he begot this and begot that and begot this and begot that. Those begots are important because at the end, it takes us to Jesus. Amen. But how can we apply this gratitude to our lives? It's quite clear that the Bible does not teach individual predestination, of course. But rather, God's plan has been predestinated. That is the redemption plan for all humanity to gather in one all his children in one. Isn't that wonderful? 
when our spirits can testify with another that we are children of God. We may run into somebody that we don't know. They may be from another church, but there's something in them. That salvation in them makes them my brother and my sister. And I can love them because we're part of the same family of God, the kingdom of God. The words here of God that were given to Israel are also given to us which clearly explains why God had chosen them as He has chosen us today to honor Him the moment we accept by faith the redemptive work of Christ. Deuteronomy 7 and 7 says, The Lord did not set His love upon you, listen to this, and He's speaking to us, nor choose you because ye were more in number than any people. Why did He choose us? For we were the fewest of all people. That's why He chose us. Not because we were the best. I know it sounds bad, but probably because we were the worst. He chose us so that he could say, Nathan, I'm going to choose you because, boy, you need some choosing right now. <laughs> At the end, so that I could do what? Glorify God. Another one of the five solos of the Reformer was soli deo gloria, which meant only God deserves the glory. Isn't that wonderful? So everything that we do as individuals or as, or as the church, everything that we do is to glorify God. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Of course, he was talking about Calvary and the cross, but he's also speaking to us in a way where he's saying, hey, if you lift me up, if you glorify me, if you give me all the honor, I'll take care of bringing them all in. That's all he wants is the glory. Amen? Now, the same is for us. I want to read this New Testament scripture here that speaks to this. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 9. Ephesians 2, 4 through 9, the Apostle Paul says, But God, who is rich in mercy, listen to that, for His great love wherewith He loved us, even when we were dead in sins, so I'm reading Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 and 9. 4 through 9. Ephesians chapter 2. Verse 5, I'm going to read it one more time. Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. Listen to what Paul is saying. Paul says in verse 6 of Ephesians chapter 2, And hath raised us up together, and what has, what has he done? He's made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. We haven't seen that promise yet, but boy, the Bible tells us that he's promised it, and if he has promised it, it will come to pass. Amen? But we see the rocky road in our spiritual lives and we think that's not going to happen. No, God, if he's promised it, he'll come to pass. Verse 8, for by grace, listen to this, ye are saved through faith. And not of yourselves. Why? Because it is the gift of who? Of God. That's the best Christmas gift you can ever receive. And then he says in verse 9, and this is where Paul tells us, it's not your strength. He says, not of works, lest any man should boast. In other words, you don't have no power for this. Put me in it and I'll take care of it. Amen. Those words are for us as well as they were for the people of Israel. The theme of this gratitude is to recognize that God has a plan for us just as he has it for each one of them. He had a plan for us. He says, O ye seed of Israel, of his servant, ye children of Jacob, his chosen ones. Now, we're talking about here about three models of thanksgiving. Number two, he was reminding them to remember God's protection. And I'm sure that all of us can testify of how many times that God protected us. You ran back into the house because you forgot something. And in those five minutes, there was an accident on the road where you were going. And you say, oh, well, it's just a coincidence. No, it's not a coincidence. God's hand of protection is upon his children. And he was reminding them of God's protection. 
Second, uh, we'll go to 1 Chronicles 16. Now we'll go to verse 23 through 24. 1 Chronicles 16, 23 through 24. Listen to what it says. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. You know, it's funny. The Bible says everything that has breath, praise the Lord. And if you were to get a microscope and look at the, the grass that is out there, you go all the way to the depths of it, there's these little micro things in the grass that receive the water that comes and lets it grow, and they're in the shape of a circle, and it looks like the Walmart happy place. If you were to look at it. And when the water comes, that happy face receives the water. That's worshiping God. Because what does it say? What does verse uh, 23 say? Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Show forth from day to day His salvation. In other words, His protection. He's reminding them. And then He says, declare His glory among the heathen, His marvelous works among all nations. To proclaim His salvation was to remember His protection. Amen? How was it that through the years God had saved them? God had protected them. Ezra is reminding them that not only had they had to praise God for gratitude, but they had to praise God for His protection. That's for us today also. Many of us could have been faced with parents that uh, could have aborted us, but they chose to do what? Give us life through Christ. And not only that, but then we were spiritually reborn through Jesus. This is the same for us today. Romans 6, 17 through 18 says, But God be thanked. Listen to what Paul says. That ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became servants of what? Righteousness. That's wonderful. So he who has not yet accepted the free gift of salvation, that is through Christ, is a slave in sin, unfortunately. And there's nothing you can do to be saved by your own power. You need Jesus. And we need Jesus. It is the same thing that he was saying to the people of Israel, that they had to thank God for his protection. I'm sure that as he was talking, Ezra was talking, they're being reminded of the time that God let them out into the wilderness. God let them out. Egypt is coming right behind them, and God opens that sea, and they pass through dry land. You know, according to archaeology today, there's the lines of the different lines of the pharaohs in Egypt, but there's one that's missing. And they can't figure out where he's at. And it is exactly in the same timeline when Israel is leaving Egypt. I said, I know where he's at. He's in the middle of the, of the sea there. Because they came back and it just killed all of them. Go find him there. Well, they found chariots there already. Might as well find everything else that's in there. That confirms to us what Ezra is saying. And if that is true, then God is real. And if God is real, then there's something that we are worthwhile to be thankful for today. It is the same thing that he was saying to the people of Israel. He's telling us today. You see, worship begins by acknowledging that God has chosen us and protected us. Amen? True worship is a combination of thanksgiving to God, worshiping God, and telling others of the great wonders that he has done. The best thing you can do to reach somebody else is share what God has done in your life. There is much for which we can be thankful to God. Amen? There's much. Just waking up this morning was a miracle. Because some went to sleep last night and woke up in eternity. But God has given us the opportunity. I woke up today in the morning and said, Oh, thank you, Jesus. You've given me another opportunity today. So thank you. Israel had to remember where God had taken them from, and so do we. The main point of Israel's worship of their thanksgiving and our thanksgiving is found in verse 25 of chapter 16. Look, look what it says, verse 25. It says, For great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. He also is to be feared among who? Above all gods. 
Amen? But I love the first part. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Now, number three. He reminded them to proclaim His name. Proclaim His name. Let's go to 1 Chronicles 16, verse 35. And you see, and you notice here, we, we're just going down the Scriptures. And we're going down these Scriptures here, and we'll go to verse 35. And it tells us the following. And ye, and say ye, save us. Look at that capital S. If you have the King James, you'll see that capital S. There. It says, save us, O God of our salvation. But not just that, he says, and gather us together. And deliver us from the heathen that we, we may do what? We may give thanks to thy holy name and glory in thy praise. So he's reminding them, hey, you need to proclaim his holy name. He's reminding them that when they saw the Lord's salvation, they could at the same time confess to everyone and announce his holy name in every single place. A while back, you, many of you that were in, in our former fellowship can remember um, the voice of salvation. And Brother Jose Reyes was the Spanish uh, minister in the voice of salvation. And we were at his funeral a few months ago, and everybody had a wonderful testimony about him. And one thing that stuck out to me was that they said everywhere he went, he talked about Jesus. He invited people to church. Even when his mind was going away little by little, he, he would be in the corner and he would say, well, that group of people there, they look like they need a church. And he'd run to them and he'd say, do you know Jesus? And oh, Well, I want to invite you to my church. We love everybody. Come to our church. And I just stayed in my mind and said, man, if God could only help us to be the same way also. To, to love God enough so that others can feel it before we even speak it with us. And he's reminding them that a grateful heart is a heart that cannot keep his mouth shut. You ever been with somebody that just talk and talk and talk? Man, he said, don't you get tired of talking? <laughs> but if that talking involves praising God, I could sit down and just talk about the goodness of God. Amen? That person is a person who cannot stop himself or herself from inviting others to the service of the local church so that others can recognize and experience the truth of salvation that only comes through Jesus. The Bible says in Romans 10, 15, And how shall they preach except they be sent? How shall they preach? As it is written, Paul said, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring, listen to this last part, and bring glad tidings of good things. You know, and during the Roman times, when they were having wars, you know, they didn't have uh, Fox News or, or CNN or all these other news outlets. They had a person that would be in charge of bringing the news. So as they were out there, and I think you can read this uh, when Eli is waiting, when the tavern, uh, the Ark of the Covenant is taken away from them, and they bring news that his sons are killed. The Bible says he was sitting on a chair, and he went back and hit his head, and he passed away also. It was the judgment of God. But one thing that I want you to notice is that Paul says they bring uh, tidings of good things. In Roman times, when they were in war, and they would see far away that a young man is running towards them, if he was running towards them like this, just regular running, they knew, oh, that's bad news. That is bad news. But when they would see him running like this, they were like, oh, that's good news. Because he was excited. He wanted to share good news with them. And Paul is, is telling them the same thing. Paul is saying how beautiful are, they, are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace. In other words, Paul is telling them and using an illustration of what they were used to of a person that runs and he's excited to share the gospel news with everybody else. And he says, blessed are they because they bring tidings of good things. Because the gospel is what? Good news. Amen? The word feet here in Greek means a person in motion. It doesn't mean a person walking. It's a person in motion proclaiming the good news. So the reason for our thanksgiving is God's promise. And we're going to come to the conclusion in 1 Chronicles 17, verses 1 and 2. Now it came to pass, 
as David sat in his house, that David said to Nathan the prophet, listen to what David said to Nathan. I, I want you to listen to this. Lo, I dwell in this house of cedars. In other words, Nathan, I got this big old mansion here. Okay? But the ark of the covenant of the Lord remaineth under curtains. He said, but the ark is under a little tent. And I got this big mansion. And he says, then Nathan said unto David, Do all that is in thy heart, for God is with thee. Because David wanted to build God a tabernacle. And Nathan says, Well, David, you do what God tells you to do. But Nathan never went and consulted with God. He didn't have the authority to tell David to do what he needed to do. Because listen to what verse 3 says, And it came to pass that same night, that the word of God came to Nathan. So God said, I want to visit you. And what did he say? Go and tell David thy servant, thus says the Lord, thou shalt not build a house to dwell in. He told Nathan, hey Nathan, you don't make good decisions for me. I make good decisions here. I know David's good intention. You know, we got good intentions, but when God says no, it's no. And I've been in situations where I've tried things two, three times, and the third time I figure, oh, wait a minute. I think God is saying no. <laughs> and I might as well listen to God because when you're out of God's will, everything, it will affect everything. It will affect everything. Now, he wanted to build a house for the presence of God, and God tells him no because there would come a time where his descendants, it would come from his lineage, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, would tell the woman at the well, what would she tell her? That worship would come in spirit and truth, that we would be able to worship God anywhere. It didn't matter if it was a tabernacle. It didn't matter if it was under a, a, a banana tree in Africa. They'd worship God. We, we used to have uh, here in, in the South, they used to call them Brush Harbor, if you remember that. They used to, that's how you started a church, a brush harbor, and then they would go from there. And, they, and what was a brush harbor? It was this little place made with twigs and everything. He'd be outside, he'd worship God, but the power of God would fall in that place. Because it didn't matter where they were, but their hearts were in the right place. Because they knew about it. So, what was the true purpose of Ezra? Was to make known the past, present, and future of Israel. And the Bible says in Psalm 71 and 8, and I want you to stand up with me as we finish here. There were not only three forms of thanksgiving, but much more than that. But we just spoke about three. But the Bible says in Psalm 71 and 8, Let my mouth be filled with thy praise. Listen to what he's saying. And with thy honor all the day. I'm going to read that one more time. Psalm 71 and 8. And the altar is open. If you guys want to come and pray or wherever you're at, just let's just pray to the Lord.